Okay, boom. And we are live. I want to thank everyone for tuning in to a very special edition of Off the Record on the People's Podcast this evening. We have a magnificent guest with us tonight, one who was going to give us some amazing information as well as inspiration, and that is none other than our sister, Dr. Iman Ali. Assalamu alaikum, ma'am. Alaikum salam. Alaikum salam. Thank you very much for taking time out of your busy schedule to come on the People's Podcast. We look forward to hearing from you. And um, we've been chronicling the history of the nation, but primarily within the last two to three weeks, uh, Minister Jabril Muhammad. So this is a, this is great that you will come on and, and, you know, let us know about him and your connection to him. The first question that we have for you, ma'am, is when did you first meet Minister Jabril? Well, um, I first met him when I was about 16 years old. And I say that because that's when I uh, became aware of the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And as a teenager, I immediately uh, began to uh, study the word of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and practice what I knew uh, of uh, the teachings at that time. And the final call newspaper and Farrakhan the Traveler was how I was first introduced to uh, our brother, Minister Jabril Muhammad, and his words, and I must confess this, that I really didn't read the final call for the news. I would read it specifically for the spiritual content. Mm -hmm. uh, the Honorable Muhammad's article, Mother Tainetta, Brother Jabril, and the Honorable Muslims Fark. And that's it. I kind of would glance, you know, what the cover would be, but I went straight to those articles. And then out, out, out of those articles, Minister Jabril's article uh, really stood out to me uh, because I could tell that, um, I could tell what time we were living in based off of reading his articles. And so as a young girl, I always was um, very, very much um, passionate about the word of God and uh, studied for many, many years and wanted to be a preacher one day uh, when I was very young. And so when I was reading his words, I could relate his words to scripture and then what we were living through at this current time. And so that's how I first met him. And that would go on from age 16 all the way until I was 21 when I became a registered Muslim in the nation of Islam. And shortly after that, I uh, became the editorial assistant. I was a journalism student at Columbia uh, College and um, in Chicago, and I became uh, editorial assistant for the Final Call newspaper. That was in 1994. And so um, working very closely with the Final Call and Brother Jabril's articles, proofreading the paper, we were on uh, every two weeks at that time. So mm -hmm. uh, not a weekly publication at that moment, but um, I thought it was such a privilege and honor to uh, work with his uh, writings up close uh, for the final call. And uh, then it was uh, February, 1995. We had just opened the Salam restaurant. We had a three day uh, event uh, where we were doing three series of openings for the community and for the laborers. It was a very high spirited uh, time in our nation as we had, you know, participated in opening this beautiful edifice. I know I put $500 down and that was a lot for me as a <laughs> college student and working for the final call. But I got the opportunity to uh, take some photos over to the National House uh, for Brother Jabril. And I did not think I was going to, to meet him, uh, but I did. Uh, the brother said, he wants you to come on inside and wait uh, to uh, take the photos back that he would approve uh, for us to use in the paper of the minister. And I was so nervous because as a college student, uh, I can remember wondering, what does this man look like? Because there was no pictures of him in the mm -hmm. final 
newspaper. And so I was wondering about him because his word was impacting me so much. And so this moment <laughs> uh, was a very big moment for me to uh, be at the National House, number one. I was just about eight months in the nation as a registered uh, believer. But number two, uh, being uh, in a position to meet a man who had impacted my life uh, for at least five years prior to that moment. And uh, he came around the corner. Uh, we were standing on that little side uh, uh, door, a little hallway leading upstairs and uh, waiting for him to come through. And he came around the corner and I was so shocked. Uh, and he was much shorter than I thought, but he was so beautiful, just so beautiful uh, inside and out and his energy um, just permeated. And I was so excited. And so he asked me a couple of questions. Number one, was I reading his article? <laughs> and mm -hmm. final what did I think about the current article that he was writing and uh, the subject matter? And so I did tell him what I felt. And he said, hmm. And so um, then that was a short, brief moment. We would meet again uh, during that Savior's Day um, celebration. And then another time uh, during that week when the minister would come over to the final call, uh, he was with him in the entourage. And I remember he took his camera out. And as the minister was standing in front of our department at the final call, he started taking photos. And I was a little nervous because there was only three of us standing there. So obviously he's taking a picture of us, uh, the sisters that were standing there. Uh, but later on, I found out he told me he was taking a photo of me and mm -hmm. he said he wanted to study me. And so uh, that would not come uh, into um, my knowledge until a year later. So this was 1995. And so I didn't see him or talk with him anymore, even though I still was working for the final call. And in 1996, I had a dream. And that dream was that I had spoken to him on the phone uh, at the final call. And so the next day it happened. And while I was, I answered the phone and it was him on the other line. And then I was talking to him and I said, oh, I had a dream about this. And he said, really? And uh, I said, uh, yeah, just that I answered the phone and you were on the other line. It was just last night. And so he said, excuse me, are you the sister who brought the minister's photos to the house? I said, yes, sir. I said, oh, you remembered that? He said, yes, ma'am, I do. And so uh, he asked me to write him. And when he asked me to write him, it was about his current articles in the Final Call newspaper. He wanted to know what I thought about the articles that he was currently writing. And that was on the ethic life of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. I realized that that was sort of a litmus test as to whether or not uh, we would continue uh, dialogue, uh, whether I would get it right. And uh, so I did write him and I, uh, he told me to uh, place my phone number there in the letter and I did. And I can remember the night that I got the phone call from him. And I was so um, honored that he would even call my home, but he was telling me about how moved he was by the letter that I wrote him and what I saw in his writing about the domestic life and uh, the integrity of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. There were two things you were not going to be around Minister Jabril and not get right. Number one, the domestic life of the honorable Elijah Muhammad. And number two, is the honorable Elijah Muhammad physically alive? Okay. You were not going to uh, be, and if you did not quite understand, he will work with you <laughs> to get you there, but the heart had to be right, okay? And the mind had to be right in reference to those two subjects, okay? And so um, I guess I got it right. <laughs> and uh, that began 
uh, almost a 30 year relationship uh, mm -hmm. between he and I um, from that uh, one letter that I wrote him uh, back in 1996. Yes. Oh, that's a lot. Beautiful. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And uh, Dr. Iman Ali, um, on behalf of myself, my family, and the View and Artists of the People's Podcast, we want to thank a lot for you and your sacrifices and the sacrifices of your family as well to establish Islam here in North America. This whole time growing up in Chicago, I, you know, would see you, but I never knew that you, you know, worked in the Chronicle Hall. I'm learning so much. And so praise be to Allah. Yes, ma'am. Um, I want to go back to those two points, the domestic life. How of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad, when you saw that as a young Muslim and Connecting with Minister Jabril, did he have to convince you or did you just understand the writings? Oh, well, I understood it uh, when I was, uh, when I first encountered it. Of course, a lot of us come into the nation. I came into the knowledge of the teachings through hip hop and mm. through a uh, cassette tape of an album called uh, Holy Intellect by the Poor Righteous Teachers. Mm. And I didn't know, you know, who, uh, that was that I was listening to as they had an excerpt of the minister, but I I knew that what I was hearing was right and exact. And uh, when I and then Malcolm, of course, which many of us, uh, he's one of the first that we hear, you know, when we come in uh, as Minister Jabril and Minister Farrakhan both came in uh, through my through Malcolm. But um, when I heard. Uh, of the split uh, between Malcolm over the domestic life of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. I remember where I was. I was at Northern Illinois University in my dorm and the, we had a study group. The Nation uh, of Islam had a study group there on campus and uh, we were in the lobby. And that's where I first heard about uh, the domestic life and Malcolm splitting with the nation. And initially there was a hurt about him, but I was so crystal clear that I was riding with the Honorable Elijah Muhammad because to me, just logic, if the, the tree, how could the tree be jealous of the fruit that it bears, mm, okay? Mm, mm, that mm. Was something that was brought up, you know, what's it, you know, Elijah Muhammad became jealous of Minister Malcolm. And that's, I, I just could not even fathom that. So I'm like, I don't understand everything, but I know that this man, I just had a love for the Honorable Elijah Muhammad from onset. And I cannot explain, I never physically met him before, but I felt like I knew him. I felt so close to him always and so i never wavered with that and so he didn't have minister jabril didn't have to convince me of anything about the integrity of the most honorable elijah muhammad so i guess that's why we connected right away <laughs> beautiful yes. praise be to a lot yes ma'am and the second the second question the book uh is, is it possible that the most honorable elijah muhammad is physically alive um what about that point when you when you first come in as a young believer? Did you already believe or did through the writings or over time? How did that come about? Oh, that was the first. So over a period of time of Brother Jabril uh, uh, and I corresponding, I mean, we would have some very in-depth conversations. Sometimes it would be five hours on the phone. A lot of times it was five hours because <laughs> Brother Jabril he, he talked a lot and uh, he had a lot to share and get over to you, which is really like download. And you as a young Muslim, you're just a sponge, just absorbing everything that he says. And uh, plus you just admired him so much. So um, two hours, five hours. And after a while, as he knew I was a journalism student and my work at Final Call, he began to ask me if I could help him with his uh, manuscripts and his publications, uh, his published books. And the first project that I worked on was the, um, the possibility book. Mm. Is it that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad is still physically alive? And mm. so that was my first time reading that book 
was when Minister Jabril sent me the revised version of it because there's two versions. One does not have the letter in it that he, um, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad wrote him about his uh, escape from that death plot. And so this was um, the one that I worked on, which is one we revised and put that letter in. So he would begin sending me uh, material uh, up on that. And uh, I found that so fascinating um, as I began to read the account, okay, from scripture, Okay, and then from those uh, interviews with Mother Tanetta and Brother Joshua Farrakhan. And so I was always a writer as a child. I was very shy. And so some things I couldn't speak to, if I had certain emotions, I could not speak. So I would write them. You know, I would write my mother letters. I would write letters to God or, you know, just anything that I really had to say that was very, you know, deep. So I always was writing from a very early age. And when I got into um, high school, I, the only class I got an A in was um, uh, analytical literature. And mm -hmm. that where we had to look into the intent behind what the writer was saying in his work or her work. And I would always get it spot on because I was a very analytical thinker. So um, what Brother Jabril had presented in, is it possible the Honorable Elijah Muhammad is still physically alive? And I wrote, he asked me to write a commentary on that. So it's on the back of the book uh, underneath Minister Farrakhan's words. Mm. Uh, it raises, if you were in doubt, <laughs> you know, there's something in um, when you're in a court case, okay, you have to deliver evidence, right? Yes, real, as we now know, he passed the law exam, so he could have been a lawyer. And mm -hmm. we looked out, laid out his defense of both men, okay? He was very thorough. He was very deliberate and precise with everything that he wrote. A comma, uh, and an explanation, everything had a meaning, everything. So uh, when I read that, and I read that account, it was clear to me because based on everything else, okay, that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad has said to us, it is very clear beyond a shadow of doubt, there is no lie anywhere that you can find in anything that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad has told us, okay? Everything has come to pass. Everything is coming to pass, okay? And so, reason reasoning okay if he said this and this and this would happen and the conversations between brother jabril and men and uh the honorable elijah muhammad specifically about this death plot and where it was in scripture all of that made sense to me and i was sold that that was the case now i didn't have at that time i didn't ha start having any experiences like the minister did with his more than a vision, but eventually that came too, uh, as a result of my relationship with Brother uh, Jabril and the word. He was feeding the mind of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad to me constantly, and uh, it was no doubt. And so when I wrote the commentary, I said, if you had a doubt, you know, this book raises the question reasonably. Is it possible? Because he's laying out what they call circumstantial evidence. And then also he's laying out actual evidence um, according to scripture and according to what the Honorable Elijah Muhammad has already said uh, would happen and would take place. And the fact that Brother Jabril could see Three years in advance, the exact date, the exact month, and the exact year 
of the departure of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. Something else was, and he didn't miss. He wasn't guessing, okay? And something that was so intriguing to me, and that was one of the first questions I asked him, how did it come to you that the honorable Elijah Muhammad would leave in February, 1975? three years in advance. And I, I think I had to ask him that three different times. The first time he did not answer me. The second time he did not answer me. Um, and on the third time he did answer me because I was not going to stop. I wanted to know that. Um, and uh, he said, I was walking across my living room floor and I had just read the Last Supper. Mm -hmm. And I said, Brother Jabril, so a lot of people read The Last Supper. They don't get that. I read The Last Supper and I don't get that. So it went back to what I put in the obituary. And Allah blessed me to um, work with Brother Jabril's own words to organize his thoughts, to put that obituary and it read like a book That's of right. his. And I thank Allah for honoring me that way. Um, but he said, I, I pulled from a letter that he had written to a family member and he had given that letter to me. Brother Jabril could see down the line. And a lot of the things that he would say to us or give us, it wasn't for 1996 and 97, 2000. It's for now. Because that letter that he gave me <laughs> back then, I was able to lift a a quote out of there where he said, um, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said that some men, women are born with the gift of prophecy mm. and then others have to work at it yes, through an intense study of history. He said, There's, there was no um, amount of study that I could have done that could have allowed me to see the exact date, the year when the Honorable Elijah Muhammad is going to leave. So what was he saying? He was born with what Allah had given him to see. Okay. Okay. So, uh, you know, some want to um, question <laughs> whether or not he's an angel. Okay. Well, you know, an angel based off of the function of an angel. That's right. Okay. Angels have functions. Mm -hmm. Angels have assignments, right? Okay. And so if they fulfill the function or the role, <laughs> then that's what it is. And so Jabril function was what? To deliver the revelation. Okay. Which he did. That's right. Okay. So, uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> over and over again. And he's still delivering that word as well. And, and we will see. Yes. Beautiful. So, yes, I answered your question. <laughs> Absolutely, ma'am. And thank you very much for the way you've answered the questions and giving us some great information as well as inspiration. Sister Miriam sends a greeting. Sister Naima sends a greeting. Sister Kalia, Kalila sends a greeting. Sister. Um, Anita Rose and Brother Kennard from House Number 74, Sister Brian, this is Anita, thank you very much, Sister Minister Aisha from Phoenix, Brother Jabril was so factual, relating scripture that you felt you were there, uh, he was so detailed, Sister Naima says, all praise to Allah, yes, he's fulfilled the function, can't wait to put this on YouTube, thank you for everyone who continues to like, share, and subscribe to the People's Podcast, right back to our sister, Dr. Iman Ali, uh, I wanted to ask you about uh, Closing the Gap, the book that you were holding, yes, ma'am, uh, how did, how did that, yes, ma'am, how did that come about? And what was your function in working with Minister Bill doing the book? 
Oh, yes. <laughs> well, I want to say this, this particular one, I have chills coming over, <laughs> over me now. Um, this book, this particular book, I received the day before the Janatsa. There's a brother named Brother Arthur uh, Muhammad who used to work for the Final Call. Many of you probably know Brother Arthur um, in Chicago. Uh, but Brother Arthur designed the cover of Closing mm -hmm. the Gap. And I had not spoken to Brother Arthur in, I don't know, over a decade. And I got a call uh, from a brother uh, named Marlon who also worked on Closing the Gap. He was uh, one who uh, spearheaded um, the initiative for the brothers out of New York and New Jersey. Uh, who helped to finance and back Brother Jabril with the financing for this book. Mm -hmm. uh, but Brother Marlon called and said, you know, uh, you remember Brother Arthur? And I said, oh, sure. He said, Brother Arthur says that he has your book, your Closing the Gap, that Brother Jabril autographed for you. He has it at his home. He thought it was his wife's, but he was picked it up and looked in it and saw that it was to Sister Latanja Muhammad mm. with love real. And he had it all these years, since 2006, he had my book. And I thought that was such a beautiful thing that um, I would get a gift from Brother Jabril uh, on the onset of his janaza and celebration of his life. And so this is my personal autograph book that he, he did for me that I just received. But um, he honored me to the, to, I mean, I, I don't have the right words, but he etched me in history with him mm -hmm. forever. And I, <laughs> I'm so um, just so grateful for that. But he honored me by um, asking myself, he wrote a letter to me and to Brother Cedric. It was the same letter, but he addressed both of us in the letter yes, and asked us if uh, Brother Cedric could write the foreword to the book and if I could write the introduction to closing the gap. Mm. And uh, he also wanted us to edit the book as well. And so in September of 2006, he flew me to Washington, DC, which is where Brother Cedric was living. And he put us up in hotel rooms. And for three days, that's all we did was read this book from cover to cover. <laughs> Well, it wasn't in a book form, it was in a manuscript form. And we were, you know, doing our edits and everything for three days. That's all we did was read, mm. read, read, <laughs> closing the gap. And um, then um, we would go out to Arizona and have, we had a, a group meeting and he wanted me to head up the marketing for closing the gap as well. And there was a team of us that were out in Arizona with him, just going over how we would market this book. And so I said, well, Brother Jabril, no one really can knows who these two men are if they look at them, right? And if you just put closing the gap, they're not gonna know what this book is about. Mm -hmm. So we need a subtitle to the book and he agreed. And then I said, why don't we call it not interviews because of course it's a compilation of his interviews with the minister, but inner views of the heart, the mind and the soul of the honorable minister Louis Bark. And that's how we got the title. <laughs> Brother Jabril <laughs> like that. And uh, we went with it. And uh, that's how that got, came about. And um, 
the introduction he wrote, <laughs> it took me a while to write mine. Brother Cedric had finished his. It took me some months because I was distracted. <laughs> and uh, I, Brother Jabril kept gently asking me, are you gonna write the introduction? I was like, yes, but I'm gonna get to it, I'm gonna get to it. And then one morning, July 7th, I believe it was, that's what I wrote in the book, I think, July 7th. Um, I woke up and what you know as the introduction just came out. Mm -hmm. And I just picked a pen up and I just started writing and writing and writing and writing until it was done. And uh, I wouldn't say I wrote that. I would say, yeah, July 7, 2006. I would say that was uh, maybe a channeling. And I was being used as a vessel because I didn't have any notes. And uh, I just woke up and wrote it. Mm -hmm. But I, I think back, Brother Jabril started sending me a lot of um, emails from believers around the country as the book came out. Different believers were writing him about that introduction. <laughs> and they were surprised that it was not him writing it. When they got to the end, they were saying they were shocked that that was a sister and not him. <laughs> and I think about that now. And over the years, I think what took place was because of his training of me and training and my infusion with him and his word, okay, that I began to write like him. Um, it goes back to the student and the teacher that I talk about in the introduction. Well, I'm speaking from experience because <laughs> I certainly, he certainly was my, my teacher. I was put with him uh, or he was put in my life uh, just not even a year in the nation. And that friendship and bond lasted, has lasted, you know, and continues today. So, um, but what he was doing with me, um, at a certain point, I left the final call and I um, went on to do television uh, news. And Brother Jabril would still send me his articles before he would send them to the final call. He wanted me to read the articles before they went to the final call. Mm -hmm. and, uh, <laughs> he had this uh, exercise he would do with me, which was, I guess now I understand that to be uh, training me. Um, he said, uh, I want you to read my article and then I want you to page me. He had a pager at that time, those who you know. Uh, he gave you a number, you know, and so he'd know who you are when you paid him. I forgot what my number was, but anyway, so um, he said, uh, um, okay, what do you see? And I tell him, oh, I saw this, this, and this. He said, all right, read it again. Call me back. Okay, I read it again. What do you see? And uh, I tell him what I saw, read it again. And I did it again. And he would do this. Like I would have to read about four or five times, okay? <laughs> and one time I read it one time and he said, what do you see? And I said, that was a military move. Mm. And he said, damn, this girl peeped me. Mm. And he mm. was blown away. <laughs> he was blown away by that like that I could see the move he was making, but he was training me up to see how he was moving. <laughs> so his articles were not just articles, okay? They were, he was not just writing to be writing, okay? Uh, they were very, very, very uh, succinct and in, in tune with what 
what's going on and deliver it as to what to point you to. And so uh, that's kind of how that happened. And then, uh, so I think that's why when they read and they read my writing here in this book, they thought it was him mm -hmm. because of all the training I had gotten under him uh, as far as how he writes and just the love for his writing. Yeah. All friends do to a lot of beautiful. And people are showing you love all across the country. And I'm going to come to your comments as well as your questions. But I wanted to ask you, um, Dr. Iman Ali, the military move. What was the move? Oh, <laughs> I cannot, I cannot remember exactly what it was, but okay, it was right. it was dealing with, you know, uh the minister, of course. And we placed that in the uh obituary about. Brother Jabril's uh, spiritual attunement, but also his military soundness. So people tend to not think that spiritual people are uh, militant in their mindset or uh, military strategy. He sent me so many books uh, over the years. And one of the books he sent me was a thick military strategy book. Because mm, mm. I like military strategy. So he sent me this really thick book on the history of the most brilliant moves in military in our history. Okay. And, um, but you have to think about it. What type of, first of all, like Brother Jabril says, can you outthink Master Farad Muhammad and the Honorable? Mm -hmm. Nobody can move you like Allah. That's right. Nobody That's right. Can work a series of events, circumstances, people, places, and things to bring about their will like Allah, okay? So no matter what you think of your military prowess, okay, Allah is the chief and chief general among us, okay? And the more closer you are with him, okay, he maneuvers you accordingly, okay? So, um, what kind of moves had to be made to get to the minister 46 years ago That's in 1977 at a time when it was very dangerous, okay? Had the minister reared his head, he could have been killed, both of them. And the fact that they got in that car and they went down into Mississippi. Nobody's going to look for you in Mississippi. <laughs> Nobody's going to expect the nation to come back up from Mississippi, you know, I'm from Mississippi. So I understand why, you know, mm. but um, no, no, no. And we talked about how it was Brother Jabril and the minister, you know, Brother Jabril helping the minister maneuver, you know, these, you know, traps that the government, media, hypocrites you know, all those years, you know, and every time uh, before Savior's Day, the minister would go out to Phoenix, not so that he could come back and have a tan and look all good, but he was down there dealing, you know, and Brother Jabril would say, you know, they would just spend hours, you know, uh, together walking and talking and going over a game plan for his Savior's Day message. So mm -hmm. before the research team that's currently in Brother Jabril was it, okay? So, yes. <laughs> yes, ma'am, right. wonderful. And thank you, everyone who's watching all across the country. Uh, Dr. Miley, we have a quick 60-second commercial break for all of the sponsors, and we're coming right back to you all. One <laughs> second. We thank you for every like, share, and subscription. Shout out to all people on YouTube as well who always show love and watch. Brother Musa, Brother Kente, Sister Auntie. Um, we're the boy, everybody on YouTube as well. We are grateful for every anonymous cash act to the People's Podcast. One second. K camera and a drone. He does television and film editing. Please reach out to him if you need any of those services. Sister Miriam's ABC I Love Me children's book and coloring book, and now Spanish book. All three available on Amazon.com. Sister Naima's Stay On Point Dance Academy, LLC. 
She teaches ballet virtually to young girls all across the country, right here in the studios of Atlanta, Georgia. Brother Kenneth's bow tie maker extraordinaire. He'll ship you bow ties anywhere across the nation. Dr. Henry Carter's King Henry Turkey Legs, right here in Atlanta, Georgia. Brother Rashad Muhammad's COVID-19 Disinfected Cleaning Services out of Chicago. Student Minister Sharif Muhammad's book, A Soldier in the Movement of Christ, available on adulsharif.com. And lastly, Brother Joshua Muhammad's book, Cleopatra, as well as No Father, No Excuse, both available on Amazon. And I want to make sure that we thank exclusively for you, Black Man by Sister Helen. Um, it is the Black Man's Sacred Book. It is a book of poetry and spoken word. You can order this on hrspatrol 42 at gmail.com. And lastly, Sister Sherry Muhammad in Asiatic Minds, a school that teaches STEM virtually to young kings and queens all across the country. Please enroll your child in asiaticminds.com for online schooling. Right back to our sister, Dr. Iman Ali. I wanted to ask you about that. Did Minister Jabir, did he ever show or speak of you about a time where he felt afraid for his life? Like during those times in Mississippi, was he ever worried that maybe the other community or the governor or someone of the enemies would, would you know, attack him? Did, did he ever tell you about a time where he was made afraid? No, he didn't tell me about any fear, but mm. he did tell me about people who wanted to kill him. Mm. Uh, he would always talk about that. Um, he said, some of them are still alive. Mm. Some of them are dead. You know, so he would talk like that about who he knew. These are obviously, if he said some of them are dead and some of them are alive, obviously he knew who they were. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. You know, and I'm going to say this, Brother Jabril was just fearless, you know, and, and uh, he was no punk, okay, uh, from South Bronx, New York, okay? <laughs> so he was, uh, I can remember after uh, Mother Tanetta's uh, transition, uh, four months later, I went to Phoenix, Arizona, uh, and I stayed uh, four nights with Dr. Patina and Brother Chipril. And I remember the first night I was there, uh, <laughs> we were in the uh, living, no, in the dining room. There was the door to the, um, the front door was there and somebody knocked on the door. And Sister Patina went to get, get up to get the door. And Brother Jabril like pushed her down and he jumped up and he went to that door like he was ready for whatever was on the other side of that door. And he would do that every time somebody knocked at that door. He would get up with this like fierceness. <laughs> and he was, I'm like, what is going on, Brother Jabril? Is he expecting somebody to come? But he was ready. You hear me? Yes, and so Taught us, he taught us how to fight, okay? Uh, but fight with the word and really defend, okay? You are not going to be around him and not know how to defend the minister and the Honorable Elijah Muhammad in this teaching. You are not. No, you're going to be well equipped. Mm -hmm. oh, praise the to Allah. Beautiful. And um, I wanted to ask you there's a brother, well, this is brother asked a question, brother Samuel X. Clark says, um, on working with Brother Jabril Muhammad, do you see any uh, thing in his departure date, July equals seven? So he's breaking down the math, but he was basically saying, what do you see in the departure date of Brother Jabril? Oh, man, it's seven, seven, seven. Mm. Okay, it's the seventh month, okay, the 16th, which is the seven, and 2023, which is another seven, mm. okay? Mm. And we know the seven, okay? That's right. That's right. Spiritual significance, seven. So he he's on point <laughs> with that uh, ascension out of that body. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, so uh, beautiful, yes, ma'am. And I wanted to ask you with the writings and the study guides and the books that you worked on, 
Uh, do you think that we would need this when it's time for the departure of the Muslim missiles far kind? Do you think that we would need to um, tap back in with these books and the defense of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad as to parallel to the defending the minister? Oh, absolutely, brother. Brother Jabril was preparing us for that time, mm. okay? For this time that we are in now. He went on a series of um, tours uh, before his uh, heart attack and stroke in 2007. And uh, in the 90s, he was crisscrossing the country, tightening up the house, okay? Betrayal and its antidote. These are some of the classic um, series that he was doing. Tightening mm -hmm. up the house was trying to get us ready, okay? <laughs> Betrayal and its antidote, you know, trying to get us ready for that hour. One of the things he would say was he would talk about um, the time of the, the 10 virgins, okay? Five foolish, five wise virgins, okay? They all knew that the darkness was going to come upon us. The bridegroom was coming. They all were told that, you know, some of them prepared, five prepared and five didn't. And he would tell me this all the time, you know, the five that had oil were able to light their way through the dark hour. And the five that did not said, can we borrow from your light? They turned to the ones that had the light, said, can we borrow? Mm. And it was said to them, turn back and seek a light. And mm. when they turned back, a wall was raised in between them with a door. And on one side was mercy, on the other side was chastisement. So we don't want to be on the side of the chastisement. We want to get the lesson now. And the time is running out. <laughs> you know, we are vastly approaching and we're really here. So his, his is a signal to something coming, okay, that's present, right? And uh, if you have oil, if you have light and you do have it, you have it in closing the gap, you have it in all of this wonderful material that we have been given from our brother on how to see our way through, okay? Yes, ma'am. So we need to pick up this book. We need to pick up, um, is it possible the Honorable Elijah Muhammad is still physically alive? And whatever we can get and study, you know, he asked the question, does God study? Mm -hmm. That's the only picture we have of him, is of him studying. <laughs> so, I mean, seriously, we want to be God, but come on. When, when will we, you know, grow up really into God? That's right. Word and through the application of that word, you know, so absolutely. We, we, need, we need this in this hour. And if you notice his janaza, you know, Minister Ishmael had called and was thanking me for, you know, helping with the program and the obituary. And he was saying how it was unlike any janaza he had ever been to. And certainly he's done a lot of janazas. And um, I was in agreement because it was, we were lifted because of a life well lived, because of a man who had deposited in us so much. How could you feel loss? There's no loss. You can pick them up. This is a living word, okay? You know, this is a living word. Um, there's no death for him. Well, There's no death for Jabril. It's forever. It's forever. And um, it was just beautiful. And it was, um, you know, we've been in a state, uh, Dr. Patina and I were on the line last night and uh, we were talking about the kind of state we're in. And at one point at the viewing, she and I were in the in the front row of the uh, 
viewing room, just her and I. I said, man, this is like Mary and Martha, okay? Mm, 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 mm. And we were looking at Brother Jabril, he had a smile on his face. If you didn't get to see him, his body, it was so beautiful. It was, he had no makeup on and he had a smile and this looked like his face, it was glistening, like the shine, the Muslim shine was on the face of Brother Jabril. It looked like we were inside of a movie, mm. or something that was, it was written in scripture. Mm. How, you know, he, of course he was wrapped Muslim tradition, so beautiful. Even the minister said, this does it, this the best looking body I've ever seen. This mm. doesn't look like, it's like he's just sleeping. Mm. But it's a testament too of how well Sister Patina took care of him. And I've known Sister Patina, Dr. Patina, <laughs> or uh, almost as long as I've known Brother Jabril, because mm. when he began sending for me to come out to Phoenix to visit, so the patina was there and mm. she, she was cooking uh, for us. And that girl can cook. <laughs> Sister Patina's food, when I first had it, it's like the cells in my body just started jumping and I could, it's like electricity. Okay, and it, it is, we are electrical beings, That's okay, right. energy than we are physical. And so the food itself and the science that she used, it was beautiful. And when we would go to the grocery store, sometimes it would be just me, her and Tina, I mean, me, her and Brother Jabril and uh, always Whole Foods. And I used to wonder how they able to afford just buying all Whole Foods. You know, sometimes we go, we get a few things from Whole Foods. We don't just get everything from Whole Foods. Yes, ma'am. So I would be like, wow. And I mean, the type of water, just everything. And uh, she can really, really cook. And she took such good care of him that you just saw it all over his physical body and remains that he was well taken care of. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. All praises due to our people showing you love all across the country. Brother Adi on the shore, Sister Minister Aisha from Phoenix is bearing witness saying about the number 77. She said the Messiah departed when he was 77. So everybody's locked in with the number 777. Peace to the guys. All right. And thank you everyone who's watching. And then people saying, Yes, yeah, she can cook and all of that good <laughs> stuff. All right. So I wanted to ask you, ma'am. Oh, here we go. Boom. Perfect. Uh, about the picture that you sent me about, I want to make sure I use the term, integrative medicine. Oh. Yes, ma'am. How did that come about? Well, okay. First of all, when I met um, Sister Patina, Sister Patina was not a doctor at that time, mm. okay? He was in school and Minister Jabril uh, was telling me about uh, what she was studying I never heard the term naturopathic doctor at that. Mind you, this was in the 90s, okay, mid 90s. And um, he was very much in support of her and helping her, okay. And I think a few years later, she must, maybe she must have graduated because I came back. He told me that he was um, going to turn his garage into a medical center, a clinic for Sister Patina. He was gonna refinance and have the place gutted, the garage turned into an office. And he did, when I came back, there was a whole a medical office in his backyard. <laughs> and he needed, Brother Jabril needed help himself. You know, he had high blood pressure, uh, which of course led to his, uh, his stroke and heart attack. But um, so, he could see now integrative medicine is the fastest growing part of the uh, medical field. Okay. 
in the United States. They're late in the United States. But Brother Jabril would say to me that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said that in the future we wouldn't have uh, doctors as we know it today. We would have healers, right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, he was in full support and saw that and helped Dr. Patina uh, to become Dr. Patina and was with it from onset before it has become the thing now, of course, which we see the health care uh, industry falling and all the industries falling uh, in America. And so integrative medicine is a term that means um, caring for the whole person and not just their disease, okay? Mm. So you're taking a look at every aspect, not just the symptoms that they're having and treating the symptoms, which is more allopathic medicine, which is Western medicine. But integrative medicine is when you take a look at the person's diet, you take a look at the emotional stress that they might have. You take a look at all of these um, who the person is and how that illness came to be. 90% of all disease comes from stress, 90%. Mm -hmm. So to find what is happening with someone, if you find what's happening you know, with them and in their life, okay? And if you can uh, uh, get to the root of that, then you can pretty much kind of help to clear that person because most of the times it will clear on an energetic level. We see it on an energetic level before it ever manifests on a physical level. So energy medicine, you know, Dr. Patina does naturopathic medicine, a lot of nutrition and things like that. It's a part of the overall umbrella called integrative medicine. So you got naturopathic medicine, you got Chinese medicine, you have massage, you have Reiki, you have um, all different types of therapies that are more Eastern and preventative medicine, right? Um, bringing back restoration and restoring the person, okay? Um, to a state of equilibrium and homostasis, because when you are at a state of equilibrium, then your body can do what it naturally does, which is heal itself. Mm -hmm. The stress that you're under doesn't allow the body to relax. It doesn't allow the mind to relax. So you can't heal. Brother Jabril would always tell me, I know now some of the things he would tell me when I was you know, younger and, and very impatient. And I would call him and, um, telling him what they were doing to me and this and that and, and he would tell me to um breathe take deep breaths now, i didn't realize the power of the breath mm. to ground you to get you back down when you're way up emotionally or mentally okay so the breath i now use that in my therapies the breath work so much right <laughs> with uh meditation and all the things that i do um, as well. And I said, oh, Jabril used to tell me that. Brother Jabril used to tell me that. And to get into hot water, as hot as you can stand, and then go to sleep, take a nap. When you wake up, you're going to be clearer. Okay. And you should think, oh, you just tell him, you just want me to be quiet. <laughs> but no, it was real because when the mind can rest, when the brain waves can lower, okay, now I know the science of it. It's about lowering your brain waves, getting you out of a hyper state, getting you back down into the alpha state brain waves, which deals with calm, relaxation. And if you can do that, then you can reset and think clear because when you're stressed, you're in the back of the brain anyway, what's called the amygdala. And that's where fight or flight and the um, hormone and chemical release cortisol, you know, which is a stress hormone, and that triggers inflammation in the body. It triggers so much. But when you're stressed out, um, that back of the brain, the front part of your brain, which is your prefrontal lobe, which is you know logical thinking, it's not even working properly, okay? Mm. Because you're in the back and that's dull up here and this is lit up. So you're in a fight or flight. Do I flee? Do I stay? Do I fight? 
And the problem is there's nothing wrong with that because we need that in times of danger. But the problem is, is when you stay there and most of us in our communities are constantly in the amygdala part of the brain, we're constantly in fight or flight because we're under threat, you know, in our communities, right? And so you, you can't ever have a creative thought. So you wonder why is it that another people can come into our communities in the same abandoned buildings that we walk past every day and then they bring up these high rises and beautiful homes. Well, the people that are there can't even think outside because they're stressed. They don't have the basic needs. You know, they're thinking about, well, what am I going to eat in the morning? Am I going to make it home from school? You know, all these things. So it really is a science to relaxation and what Brother Jabril was telling me to do is to go relax, get in hot water, go to sleep, breathe, wake up. Let's look at it again once you, you wake up. So, um, yeah, that's kind of how that started. And, um, and then my own self-healing, you know, um, Brother Jabril was impressed with uh, something I was able to get myself out of. <laughs> well, I wouldn't say I got myself out of. A lot definitely helped me. Uh, but he said that it was a sign of uh, how high I could go. And he began to pour into me, you know, at a time when I was feeling uh, what they call situational depression uh, at that time. And I wrote him about that in my first letter to him and what I had went through, uh, the traumas that I had gone through as a child. And I, I want to say this for anybody that's listening, because I know that, you know, our young people today are going through a lot and um, may not think that there is a way out. Uh, I bear witness that there is a way uh, out and um, you can shift out. And there is a way. So we want you to try to find somebody that you can talk to, find someone that can, uh, if just one person, you know, that can help you. But there's so many things uh, that can get you out of a situation that you think there's no way out, okay? There's always a way out. If you can breathe and you can think and you can wake up again, you have another chance, another opportunity. So Brother Jabril uh, poured into me, you know, um, just, just strengthening me, strengthening me, strengthening me. Um, and I'm just forever grateful, you know, to him for everything that he has meant to me in my life and means to me now. So, yes. Beautiful. Go ahead, T. That's as well. Praise be to Allah. And people are showing love all across the country saying, of course, teach. I uh, praise you so loud, beautiful. The same. Thank you, everyone who's watching. I had a question for you, ma'am. If people are you on social media, is there a way for people to email you questions? Because some of these questions are going to go deep, and we don't want to hold our sister for too long. But is there a way for people to reach out to you on social media? Sure. Well, my social media page got hacked, uh, so I did just uh, start a new one. Uh, it's uh, on Instagram, Doctor Iman Muhammad Ali. You can go there. It's probably you might not see anything, but that is that's where I'll be. Um, if you want to send me uh, anything uh, by via email, you can send it to Iman B Well at Gmail. That's an Iman I M A N B B E W E L L at gmail.com. So Iman B Well is my email address. Yes, sir. And, and awesome. Brother Walter, that's a, that's a heavy question. So I'm going to let you email her so y'all can, you know what I'm saying, deal with that because that's a whole podcast that we have to deal with that <laughs> right now. Sure. Yes, ma'am. Okay, we have two more questions for you. I wanted to ask you, what type of music do you like to listen to? Oh, man. Um, I like hip hop, okay. uh, of course. Um, yeah, because hip hop brought me into the nation and Islam. Uh, Jay Z, J Electronica, those are my favorites. Um, and classical music, uh, I love. I do love the 70s music uh, back in the day. And that, that just was like soul music, you know? Uh, we, uh, oh, we have an album that we, that I executive produced. It's called Emmett Till, A Hero. 
and it was um, it's available on SoundCloud. If you go to Emmett Till a Hero, it's a free download. It's the Nation of Islam's hip hop artist compilation hip hop album, all about our brother Emmett Till. Uh, we have uh, brother Ben X, brother Young Khan, the Don. Oh man, so many of our our great ones, Golden Child, brother Hashim. All of them are on that album, uh, and it's a great piece. So you can hear our work. You'll hear me too, uh, but I'm just maybe uh, curating a little few pieces there. Um, but yeah, that's the music that I that I like. And then I do play music. I would say hmm, it is okay. music. Uh, they are uh, called quartz crystal singing bowls, hmm. and um, they are for healing. And um, I'm very much into the binaural beats and the frequencies and how they impact the body. And so I do sound baths uh, in my everyday life and then professionally as well. I did get to do one for Brother Jabril and I was very, very honored to do that. That's In fact, that's the last words that he said to me. And he said, as I was explaining to him over the phone, what was gonna happen, Dr. Patina called me and asked me if I could uh, do some sound work for Brother Jabril. And um, I was telling him what was getting ready to happen and the science of it. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, color, medicine, and music, okay? So that is the basis of the true religion, okay? But we don't know, well, what does he mean by that? You know, we like we just stop right there. You know, we have to delve into that. And so through uh, playing these singing bowls, these crystal singing bowls, each one resonates with the different energy center of the body uh, known as the seven chakras. And those are is where our bodies hold frequency. OK, we are frequency. We are an instrument. OK. We need to be attuned and tuned up <laughs> like anything, right? That's why we fast, you know, that's why we cleanse our, our bodies so that we can tune up as the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said. And so um, I play those uh, along with rain sticks, um, Chilean rain sticks, which is an ancient um, instrument, uh, ancient Asian gongs. And I'm making an album now um, I've teamed up with the Monroe Institute for who they're the founders in uh, binaural beats and hemi sync. So mm -hmm. anyway, um, that album will be available. It's a healing album, really. As you listen to it, you'll be able to, you know, go to sleep at night if you're suffering from insomnia. You and people have even levitated in my class. And uh, one class, I saw this woman's legs just rising up off of the floor. And I thought she was doing that, you know, voluntarily. And she's like, no, did you see me levitate? And I was like, really? I said, that, that's amazing. But when I looked it up, because the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, there's a science to everything. And so when I looked it up about sound, sound being able to levitate objects. Mm, mm, okay, mm. <laughs> so, you know, we talk about the technology on the wheel, right? And sound and frequency, okay? And what it can level, okay? Level buildings, it's just uh, sound. And that's real. You know, I've had a number of people levitate just based off of the, the frequency of those bowls. So, yeah, really beautiful. The last words I heard Brother Jabril say to me, which I think is so beautiful, after I told him what was going to take place and what I was doing, he said, thank you. Mm -hmm. That was the last thing I, last time I heard his voice. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yes, ma'am. Now, can we, I want to go back to these bowls and the sound. Do, how do people get it? Like, like if we in Atlanta or people around the world, do you just... Yeah. You got to do you go to a store. Do you have like a YouTube breakdown? Like, how do we do it if we want to, you know, tap into that? Oh, yes. So uh, I yeah, stay tuned to my uh, Facebook page, uh, my Facebook and my um, Instagram. I will be uh, starting a YouTube channel about that. But if you want to just, you know, hear something now, you can go to YouTube and you can look up uh, Crystal Singing Bowl um, 
sound baths. And you just find the frequency that you like the most and you can listen to that free, you know. Um, the singing bowls, you can purchase them, you know, through Amazon, you know, they're very popular. Um, and each one, you know, they correspond to an energy center. Now, the thing about these energy centers is that it's not just energy. It, everything energetic has a physical counterpart and everything physical has an energetic counterpart. Okay. So the unseen and the seen realm. So your energy centers have organs and glands that correspond. So let's say my throat chakra, there's a picture of me doing Reiki on Brother Jabril that somebody put on social media. So I, I you see my hands over his head um, and the frequency that goes through a Reiki practitioner's hand is measured at 7.6, 7.8 Hertz. The earth's natural frequency is 7.6 Hertz. OK, so when you you're not putting your energy into another person, you are channeling universal life force energy. OK, from the crown chakra. Right. So there's a crown, which is at the top of the head. There's your third eye chakra, which is in the middle of the forehead. There's your throat chakra, the heart chakra, solar plexus, sacral, and then your root chakra. Those are the seven. And each one of them have a gland and organs that they're attached to. So in my throat chakra, I'm doing some Reiki on one picture with Brother Jabril on his throat. And I just have my hands laying there and you really do, the FDA has measured this, okay? So Reiki is used in hospitals around the world, is used a lot for cancer patients. It is the most research-backed energy-based therapy that is out. So that mm -hmm. means most clinical studies have been done. It is known to increase white blood cells to help you fight disease. Uh, so that's why it's used a lot for cancer patients. So anyways, um, so I've had my hand around the throat. So the throat, because of his vocal cords and then plus it's brain situation too. So you're talking about um, 7.68 hertz of frequency. What it's doing is it's corresponding and stimulating your own healing, okay? Because your energy, your electricity, so you're stimulating your own electrical field or what they call now the biofield. Science calls it new sciences. Okay, well, we do have a field of energy around the body. So the throat chakra deals with your communication, your truth, but it also is your thyroid gland, okay? So a lot of times if people have issues where they might have been told to be quiet, not to, or they were invalidated. They may have issues at the thyroid. If they have a thyroid problem, chances are they are somewhere in their life that somebody invalidated their voice or they couldn't have their voice, you know, abuse or something took place that is sitting there in that energy center. And it, when it, does it move, it causes a physical imbalance there that results into some type of tumor or disease, et cetera. So everything shows up first energetically before it ever gets to the physical uh, realm where it's a hard tumor or something like that. So, and then your heart chakra, of course, deals with your affinity and your love. And that is your thymus gland. Okay, and the thymus gland deals with your T cells, uh, white blood cells that help you to fight disease and vi viruses. So if you notice when you're, you've had a heartbreak or something like that, you ever heard of someone dying of a heart heartbreak or dying of a broken heart? That's very true. A lot of times when people um, are really in love and there's one person that they love dies and the spouse is left, then the other person typically kind of goes shortly after, you know, um, because the immune system is connected to the heart and love. So a lot of times when you are uh, sad or whatever, your immune system goes down immediately. You get a cold, 
get the flu, your immune system is compromised like that because it's all located in that same area. So every one of the energy centers does have a physical counterpart. Yeah. So we work to clear people of their energetic uh, imbalances so that, you know, we can, we can help them stay healthy and not, you know, get to the point where it has to be, you know, some type of tumor that might need to be removed with surgery or something like that. Well, it's teacher Dr. Riley, and people are showing love and saying excellent. Oh, Brother Amir Khan, I think this is the first time watching. Thank you for watching, sir. Thank you. I mean, it's Aisha saying teach. This is Kalila. That's Vanessa saying, okay, people just showing love all across the country. And uh, for those who know, you know, Brother Joshua Leonard Muhammad, they know that I'm big into superhero movies and X-Men, things of that nature. People with who are showing force and power and tapping into energy in a yeah. human form, and, and they show it in film, and when you're talking like this, I'm seeing, I'm like, oh, I know who does that. I know who that power has that power, the healing yes. hands and things of that nature. So that's all. That's, that's right. That's right. You know, the minister, I don't know if you uh, paid attention to the, uh, the Janaza. We should study it. We should go back over that, study that Janaza. Um, but he dealt a lot with the uh, metaphysical side, if you will, of yes, teaching of the honorable Elijah Muhammad. And these things that, you know, um, astral body travel, traveling out of the body, okay? This is real. And there's a science to it. Because <laughs> mm -hmm. the honorable Muhammad said there's a science to everything. And you can get out of the body at will. You can get back in it at will. Um, but the Holy Quran tells us that Allah takes our soul at night. That's right. Okay? So this is not, you know, I feel like, you know, the minister says, well, you could believe or not. They're like, oh, so much science to to this aspect of what you're saying, brother minister. And, you know, he talked about um, brother uh, Abdullah Yassin and brother Kamal Kareem and them, them being children, yes, okay, having the ability to see in the water, okay. and Brother Kamal Kareem, I first heard that name through Brother Jabril's book, Is It Possible? The Honorable Elijah Muhammad is still physically alive. Mm -hmm. If you go back to the second version of the book, Brother Joshua Barkhan's interview, he uh, mentions there were three teenagers. Listen to this. Three teenagers in 1975. It was Savior's Day, okay? People were in town from everywhere, FOI from everywhere. Yet there was an older man who was securing the Honorable Elijah Muhammad all day long, and he was ready to go. He called over to Brother Herbert's home, uh, was Brother Jabba at one time, Brother Herbert, who was Muhammad Ali's manager, son of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. That's Brother Olive's, uh, Sister Maria Farrakhan's husband. And uh, he answered the phone. And uh, he was looking, the brother was looking for relief at Mercy Hospital. And so Brother Olive gathered <laughs> who would, would go with him. And the two that went with him was Brother Joshua Farrakhan and this brother named Kamal Kareem, who was spending the night with them that night. And uh, the three of them went to Mercy Hospital. They all were teenagers. I don't think the oldest one might have been 18, but Brother Kamal was 15 years old. And Brother Joshua, in, that stood out in the, in the manuscript about the brother who was there, who could see into the future is what brother Joshua mentioned. And he said he felt comforted that brother Kamal was there because Kamal was gifted in that ability. And he said that uh, he tested brother Kamal and said uh, he called him three times. And he said when Kamal didn't come 
And then when Kamal did come, Kamal, he said, uh, brother, uh, you don't have no, you can't tune in or you don't have no ability. He said, yeah, because I called you. And then brother Kamal said, yeah, three times. And that made brother Joshua shut up. <laughs> Point. And he said he shut his mouth at that point. But brother, but I was interested to know about this brother Kamal. I wondered, you know, and, and brother Jabril asked the question, is that brother Kamal the messenger's son? And he said, no, no, sir, that's Kamal Kari. Well, all these years, I really was wondering about that brother. And about five years ago, I met that brother. He's still alive. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, my goodness, brother, you, you, your testimony has to be written. Brother Kamal was the last brother. He was in the room when the doctor came in and put the cotton swab on the down of Elijah Muhammad's nose. He was there. And Brother Kamal was 15 years old. And Brother Kamal is also the brother who looked in the water and saw the rifle that was buried across the street from the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's home. And when the FOI went to search those bushes, they found that rifle. And that mm -hmm. got, they printed that in Muhammad's speech, that got the attention of the uh, messenger. And then he began to put Brother Kamal with some of the scientists and angels that used to come to the house. Uh, he knew Brother Simi Khan, and he knew the other brother also. So I have uh, <laughs> been in touch with Brother Kamal and finding all this history out. And um, Brother Kamal just recently, um, and the minister was saying, in the janasa that when you're very spiritual, you can go places and you can hear things and you can, without the auditory, we call it clear audience, being able to hear clearly. It's not necessarily with your physical ear, uh, limited with that, but it's beyond that. That's why we call it a sixth sense, right? It's mm -hmm, the mm -hmm. third eye. Okay, you got your two physical eyes, but then you have the third eye. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad called it radio in the head. And Brother Jabril, in his, um, in his letter to us about helping him with closing the gap, he put in there that in 1972, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, in Theology of Time, talked about the ability that Jesus was taught. And he said that in 30 years from now, some of our people would have that ability. And I wondered, well, why did Brother Jabril put that in his letter to us <laughs> to write the introduction and the forward to close the gap? What did it have to do with that, you know? And so um, Brother Kamal, uh, had that ability. And uh, recently, uh, just this past December, I, um, I woke up one morning and I was thinking about the minister. His, the spirit was on me. And I said, oh, the minister is so, he's so sad about not being able to talk with Brother Jabril and the two of them, and I just felt the minister's spirit. He's lonely. He needs a spiritual eye. He needs a spiritual voice. And I sent Brother Kamal a message. And I had not talked to Brother Kamal in a few weeks. And I said, Brother Kamal, the minister needs you. The minister needs, you need to call the minister. And he said, oh, I've been trying. <laughs> I said, okay, well, you know, call Joshua, call Brother Joshua. And 30 minutes later, he texts me back. He says, sister, you were right. 
He said, the minister said, brother, I've been waiting on you for four days. And uh, that the minister ended up bringing Brother Kamal to um, Arizona because Brother Kamal was able to see uh, he saved the minister's life in the, uh, I think it was the 80s or 90s in Miami. Brother Kamal saw two men coming to the minister's hotel room and it was gonna be a setup. They were gonna knock on the door, but the authorities were gonna be behind them and they were gonna rush in to try to kill the minister. And it did happen just as Brother Kamal said that it would, but the minister had got out in time before they got there because of what Brother Kamal saw. And so when he was out in Arizona, uh, this past, right before Savior's Day, the minister introduced him to everyone that was at the house, uh, at the palace in Phoenix and said, this brother saved my life. And he talked about that ability that he and Brother Yasin had. And he's told us the same, he told everybody the same thing he said at Brother Jabril's janazah, that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad was like, why did Allah was allow these children to have these types of uh, abilities? Because he's trying to prove to us that we are God, you know, that, and I forget exactly how he said it, but uh, yeah, so Brother Jabril, Brother Paul, and you know, we are a nation of gods, and that is the purpose of the coming of Master Prophet Muhammad, his ultimate aim to make each one into a god, and so our abilities are coming back, okay, as we are clearing the traumas, Okay, we are almost a hundred years into the coming of Master Prophet Muhammad. Okay, it took Yaqub what six hundred years to make that. That's right. That's right. So we're almost at a hundred years. We're certainly not what we're going to be, but we're certainly not what we were. We are new people because of this teaching, and because of this man, we have Islam today. We have we, we are so grateful to Allah for his angel, Brother Jibril Muhammad. And why, you know, the angels have, it's a hierarchy, okay? You know, um, Jibril, why does Allah say in the Holy Quran, whoever is an enemy to Jibril and Allah and his angels, Allah is an enemy to the disbelievers. Mm -hmm. But why is Jibril mentioned by name? Okay, something. And then when the minister uh, revealed about the Honorable Elijah Muhammad telling him, brother, did you know that you were an angel? Brother Jibril sent me a message that night asking me through email, which angel was the minister based on what, what did I think he was? And then I just shot back at him. I said, oh, that's easy. That's Michael. Because the function of Michael and the function of, see the angels are always paired together and Jibril and Michael are together. Mm -hmm. in the okay. And Michael has control over the web. Okay. And he contended over the body of Moses. That's right. Okay. Come on. So I said, oh, that's easy, Brother Jibril. <laughs> so yeah, uh, this is real. So that's why the minister said, you know, if, if you were an angel, then I would send you one. So mm. that's why Allah sent Jibril to Michael. They're doing their work too. We thank a lot for them. Yeah. <laughs> you going deep, you, listen, you going deep, Dr. Ryan. You teach it. People bear with us all across the country. Praise be to Allah. Uh, thank you, everyone who's watching. Beautiful. Thank you, um, official Muhammad, um, Mas 43. Um, thank you very much. They're saying long live Muhammad, and thank you all very much. And mm -hmm. um, <laughs> yes, thank you for the text messages. Well, people texting me. 
um, live commentary as well. Thank you all very much. Okay, so Dr. Iman, it's a lot. We want to talk offline, but we got to come back for part two because so many people have so many questions for you. You know what I'm saying? We got so many questions for you. Um, no, no, brother, we have a real teaching. I mean, it's 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 live, it's real. We are fulfilling the, these books. We're walking out of both Bible and Quran and uh, Holy Quran. And uh, it's amazing to see and to just sit back. I mean, the Janaza, it's like you were out of body. Like I was telling Dr. Patina, she said, well, what is it that's, I said, you know, you know, Brother Jabril talked about the rapture. And he used to talk to me about the rapture a lot. Was it real? What theologians say, is it real or is it allegory? And the rapture, you're caught up, okay? The believers are taken up with him. And there mm -hmm. was a sharing of the power. I said, it feels rapturous, you know, because we don't, I haven't even really cried because it's nothing really to cry about. Brother Jabril has been so present ever since even the time of his departure out of the physical body 4 49 a.m at that time i'm on the east coast i was the thought of him came in my mind around that same time i was talking to a believer and i said brother jabril used to call me a, he used to say a term he used to call me and he would calm me down every time he would call me that. And then um, something that he told me right before he had his stroke, that came back full in my mind. And that was around the same time of his transition. And uh, every, every day, every night, he's been so present. There's been so many visions. And he told me, and one uh, shortly after, maybe 24 out of 48 hours after, he said, um, I'll be, I'll be, I'll continue to write something like that, continue to write, and I'm going to do it through you. Mm. Then, <laughs> and then Dr. Patina sent something about the obituary. And she said, well, it's not as thorough as I would like for it to be. She said, but I have an interview, Brother Jabril, in his own words. And I'm going to give it to you. And I'm going to give you the other copy. And if you can pull it all together and organize it. And that's how we got this. So I was writing. And it was Brother Jabril's words. These are his words about his life, his account of what happened, not somebody else's account of what took place. It was him writing through me. And I said, dang, that happened quick. He said that, and it came to so fast. And uh, it's a beautiful thing. So yeah, he lives and uh, forever, forever. We're grateful. All praise due to a lot. Yes, ma'am. Well, I want to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to come on the People's Podcast. We have all been uh, gratefully, uh, I mean, we've been fed, man, some amazing information today. I got so many notes. People in the comments have literally, the chat is going up and we can't wait to put this on YouTube because we have to have all this documented for our part two. But I got so many more questions for you that I will address, inshallah, on part two. This yes, is sir. This is Joshua Leonard Muhammad signing off for the People's Podcast. Assalamu alaikum, ma'am. Wa alaikum salam. Thank you all for watching.